Hello, hello everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We have a very special uh, panel program that we put together around our theme of Got DevOps. You remember the uh, old commercial, you know, Got Milk? Um, and we're talking about the interplay of DevOps and platform engineering and SRE. And, uh, you know, there's been thoughts about these things are in competition with each other, or one's replacing another, or how did this work? And actually, we're going to talk about why these uh, three areas of expertise, whether there's overlap or not, uh, there's collaboration, but why they're, you know, better together kind of approach, the dynamic trio of platform engineering and uh, DevOps and SRE. So I really have the great pleasure of, of talking with you today with two great folks, people that I've had an opportunity to do other work with in the past mm -hmm. and uh, pleasure of doing that again today. Uh, first is Hope Lynch, Senior Director of Platform with CloudBees. Hope, welcome. Good to be chatting with you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you for having me today. This is going to be such a great conversation. I already know that to be true because I know yes. you both well enough to say, okay, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> really, I mean, I'm not just hype, hyperbole. I really do mean that uh, <laughs> yeah. for everybody that's attending. And Martin, welcome, Martin, is uh, Phil CTO with Harness. Harness, you and I have had some great conversations too. We, we have indeed both on and off the camera. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, yes. it's, uh, it, no, I'm really looking forward to that. I think this is going to be fun. Me too. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. And thank you um, for also helping sponsor uh, this conversation, a part of our uh, Got DevOps and DevOps Next uh, programs at TechStrong and TechStrong Research. You know, we're talking about we've been doing these things for a while you know platform engineering isn't new like it might have been to folks maybe a year or so or ago sre isn't new we've been doing that in in organizations and those practices have, have been built up and so there's a lot of good experience about this and i think the conversation about these three things has advanced from you know is platform engineering replacing devops or what does this mean or how these things work together and that's what we're going to explore both the kind of working the interplay the lessons learned, best practices, what are some of the technology things that we should think about maybe even differently as part of these three functions? Um, you know, operationally, what does this mean for us as well as during development and their cultural impacts, all of these things. So I, I say that and just to give everyone not only a little preview of what we're talking about, but also to mention that we really love to have our participants, I, I don't wanna say audience, but our participants that are here with us today, joining us digitally. We three may be on camera and have microphones. You have a microphone too, it's called chat. We really want you to join in on chat. First by, where are you joining us from today? Uh, I'm joining from uh, Santa Clara, I'm out here for a, uh, an event and uh, enjoying myself. Uh, at least the hotel, hotel Wi-Fi is holding up. So please uh, let us know where you're joining us from. Most importantly, we want to hear from you in chat and in the Q&A tab as we're having this conversation about this. And, and you know, we're not here all here pitching a product or pitching one thing about it. We're really trying to help advance the conversation with our own expertise and, and backgrounds and companies that we also re represent, of course. Um, and that but that means you you have opinions about this stuff, too. So. Feel free to jump in with your reactions, your comments. You know, hey, I think that's a great idea. You know, who's this wacko Mitch? But I like Hope and Martin. They're good. I, I understand what they're saying. What's he about, right? So, <laughs> um, you know, don't get no personal attacks. No, I don't mean that. Um, but uh, we'd love to hear your reactions, your comments. Hey, we're doing this here. This is how it works at our company. Um, we've, we've run into these bottlenecks. and We've actually had some successes here. You're welcome to put questions, uh, both in chat, but it's a little easier if you put that in the Q&A tab of our webinar software. So feel free. And we will roll that into our conversation. You'll find actually sometimes it actually will guide and shift our conversation based on your input, um, which really does make this an us conversation with uh, everybody that's participating. So the more you contribute, the the better behaved we are of trying to hit the hit the questions and topic areas that you'd like us to talk about as well. And just a reminder too, we will have a survey at the end to ask you for our feedback about how today's session went, what we can do to improve, what went well, all those good kind of things. And we're also recording the session. So, you know, once it's on the internet, it lives forever. 
And uh, it'll also show up in an email inbox, uh, your email inbox soon. So you can share it with your friends, go back and rewatch a little part of it that there was really something interesting that that person said. I want to capture what that was. Um, so feel free. Or there's some good ideas you want to take back to your team and your organization or uh, technology direction, whatever that might be. So let's, let's first set this conversation up and uh, maybe hope if you would start out first. You're, you're director of platforms. I'd like you to, to share what platform means from your perspective, whether it's part of what it means in your role or more generally. Yeah. How you think about that. And then how does that relate to SRE and DevOps or is it all part of similar things? Mm -hmm. So there, there are many potential definitions of a platform. So I, I do like the way that you, you frame that question. Um, from my perspective and, and where I work, it is, you have uh, an application with a unified look and feel, hopefully in best cases, a centralized data source, right? So if you have a piece of information, it is accessible across the entire platform and you have a unified platform in that the applications work together seamlessly. So even if it is uh, in some ways modularized, right, you can add or remove modules. Those modules are, are tied in in such a way that once they're hooked in, you don't realize that they potentially are separate components. And what this does is it makes it easier for the user, whether they're a developer or someone higher in the organization, um, to get what they need from that platform and do their jobs effectively and hopefully uh, contributes to a better experience. Fantastic. Okay, Martin, here's the, I don't know, how, it doesn't have to be point counterpoint. You can agree or, or have your own perspective. Um, love to hear your thoughts on, you know, you're working with customers all the, team, all the time, like Hope is. Give us your perspective on what does a platform mean? So it, I, it's not entirely dissimilar. I, I think we're probably talking along the same lines, that common unified into, you know, common unified interface, common way of consuming, uh, you know, applications or services through a platform. I think there is, you know, within a platform, you tend to have things that belong to the platform that are available to all of the things. So you kind of stop with some of those duplications. I think that's key to a successful platform. So, you know, I know maybe your RBAC is, you know, your your access control is, is centralized as well as your authentication is centralized, right? So you've taken advantage of platform, you don't have to build that for every module or service or product that, that runs on the platform. And then when I think about it, especially from, a, I guess, from some of the commercial applications like, uh, you know, organizations I, I've been to and they, they very much use it as a, you know, as a way to, um, uh, fast track, uh, like launching of, of services and products because they are able to consume. They already have somewhere that they can deploy that's reliable, that's, you know, fast. But the, the bit I, I guess we didn't talk about was the, you know, all the bit that goes into making one of those platforms work and run. But I, I think we'll probably come to that. But I, I think we're fairly aligned on, you know, it's a good central place that makes things easier, <laughs> ideally. You know, just to highlight a few things that you both were, had mentioned. One is sort of the opposite of a platform is a integration of a whole bunch of different disparate things, right? A bunch of tools. How do they share data across from each other? How does work happen between those two things? Do I have to go to different UIs and, you know, am I duplicating work? Is it like, you know, this is presented in green and this is presented in red and I have to do this big context tech shift as I go from one tool and to another. Um, sometimes I think um, as development organizations or operations organization too, we're, we're in the tool business, tool integration business, not in the software mm -hmm. deployment and operations business. And one of the ideas behind a platform is some way of those things operating as a cohesive unit, doing some data sharing, making the flow across to work from the different ca capabilities or disciplines as part of that platform. Another thing we haven't talked about is standardization. Um, and I don't mean um, evil empire, you know, Darth Vader standardization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but more, let's reduce complexity at where we can out of our environment. And it seems like 
whether you're working in a DevOps tool chain or you're working in, you know, five different Kubernetes environments with 25 different configuration differences across three clouds, you know, how do you, how do you get your arms around that? That I think it seems to be another big driver behind why we want to think about platforms and how we um, make it, make everybody's life easier, at least as much as we can. Um, Martin, share your thoughts on that. Uh, that's a, that's a couple of places I could go with that. Actually, uh, the evil I'm empire. Part, I want to hear about that. The evil empire. So, so the evil empire part. <laughs> the evil empire part, though, is you know, uh, I, in fact, I was speaking to somebody today, literally earlier today, who was saying, "What I want is I want the bumpers down the side of the. You know, when you go bowling." Mm -hmm. He was talking about his own engineering teams and he's saying, you know, what I want is I want them to have the bumpers, you know, like you have for your kids down the bowling alley so that they can bowl and be as creative with their bowling as they like. <laughs> but there are things that are out of bounds. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, I and I think, you know, being able to provide governance and, and some, you know, if you like the outer limits of what's acceptable and not acceptable, you must do this security testing. It's not really optional, but let's make it really easy, you know. But actually, if you want to write in, I don't know, depending on, you know, the organization and, and, and what they're trying to do. But, you know, maybe building applications in Go is fine. Building applications in .NET is fine. Building applications in Java is fine, right? Those are th all things that I'm, you know, happy that, that the engineers can do, but they need to do it within certain constraints. It needs to be able to deploy to say my Kubernetes cluster. It needs to be able to use one of these data stores that we're, you know, that we will support and provide easy access for. And it needs to do the security testing. So, you know, you want to allow innovation, but do that with enough control that you know it's governed. And then when the software goes out the door, it's secure. <laughs> it's had the right level of testing, you know, and I, I think we can roll over into the SRE side a little bit because if they're deploying to those platforms, then you know actually the platform itself is where a lot of that site reliability stuff happens, and, and you know, and you're building on top of it. So right, I think the governance piece is kind of it's critical, but you do need to do it within you know you you don't want to stifle innovation for the sake of because uh, you know, then you end up with unhappy engineers, uh, which is the other side of that where you're saying you know hey. We want the engineers to have a good flow, right? They want to be able to go to one place. They know where to go to get it. They don't want to context switch all the time, as you mentioned, right? And so I think having that flow and doing that within some guardrails to, to let them innovate, let them do, let them be happy in what they're doing and build cool stuff. Because, you know, I spent a lot of time as an engineer. I can see hope nodding away. <laughs> but, like, I spent a lot of time as an engineer. Like, you, as an engineer, you want to, you want to solve problems. And so taking away some of those pain points makes it easier. Good. Okay, Hope. I know you've been holding the horses back. Yeah. Just a little I, bit. I, okay, I let them run. I think one one of the challenges here, and Martin did touch on it, um, there are there are pros and cons when you are looking uh, at standardization, right? Um, yes, no evil empire please. But um, a little bit of evil, just enough. <laughs> uh, but, you know, not so much that uh, the teams feel that they don't have any flexibility, right? Um, if there is, you know, a pocket somewhere that the platform engineering team is saying, well, you know, they are, you know, a small percentage of the people we need to serve, um, we're not really going to pay a lot of attention to them. They're going to rebel. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the concept of shadow IT is not just for, you know, IT teams. It's also for development teams. And those teams will bring in the, the tools that they want if uh, they feel they are not being served. And the other part is... Sometimes, and I have experienced this, um, I ran a platform, a, a couple of platform engineering teams. You can have people who are very resistant to the change. And if they perceive or smell at all that it, it feels like there is a control coming, you know, over their work, even if you promise you will get to spend less time 
on the tedious parts of the job. And more times on the fun part, they don't believe you, right? And, and you have to prove it. So there's a big change management uh, challenge there also for platform engineering teams. A lot of times there's a focus on the technology, but the cultural aspect of the change uh, for a lot of the teams is also super important. Yeah, it's very I, easy I, to centralize versus standardize. Those don't mean the same thing necessarily, right? A centralized is a who does it and standardized is how we do it, right? Consistently as well. Martin, you were going to say something. Yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to comment on that cultural change thing. Honestly, and, you know, I, speaking to some of our customers, some of the biggest successes I've seen, and not just customers, like when I was doing this hands-on myself, the biggest successes I've seen are when the the cultural change the change management is planned almost before right we want to make these changes to make things better easier faster okay how do we take everybody on the journey with us right it's not how do you enforce this on them you want them to go with you you want them to understand why you're doing it the steps you're taking to get there why you're making certain decisions and make them feel part of those decisions like that good change management is the difference between generally successful rollout of any kind of software or, or change but i think you know i think you're right you you get religious groups I, i'm using that phrase you know in quotes you know around technology uh, we've all seen it <laughs> probably been part of it at some point you know uh, so <laughs> it's a uh, you know, I, I think you have to, you know, work to take those people with you as, as much as possible. You're never going to take everybody, but honestly, the most successful ones, and you know, I've seen this recently with things like like IDPs, like platform engineering, you know, solutions like the kind of we're rolling out these golden landing zones. You know, all of those they actually require you to take the engineers with you, to, to take the customers with you. In fact, I think is the the way to think of that. If you're if you're running a platform, for sure. Yeah, and also think of the developers as your customers, right? 100%. External customers, but your internal customers that you need to, 100%. you know, along with what you're saying, uh, bring them along on the journey, right? Don't just uh, show up one day with a package and say, this is, this is your job. Uh -huh. To that point, um, we are actively uh, writing our report, our, our DevOps Next report, and we've had a survey in, in the, I call it in the wild, gathering data from practitioners, people who are living and breathing um, this. It's interesting, 60% of the respondents, it kind of falls this way of why are you do, adopting platform engineering? Developer productivity is number one, not, not by much, but just slightly ahead of standardization, which is also not that far ahead of improving security and decreasing complexity. So there's many factors that folks um, are adapting a platform approach. And I say platform approach because it doesn't apply just to our dev test environments. It's also the, the tooling and, and kind of our whole part of the, all parts of the SDLC are potentially can be viewed as platforms. Um, but the big emphasis, I think a lot of it's been around developer productivity. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts on IDPs and internal developer uh, portals which a portal can be a, just a place to go get things from, doesn't mean that those things aren't an unorganized mess. They could be just as complex through a portal as they would just trying to find where it's located. Um, how do you go beyond just having a uh, kind of pretty web page to go get things from and have something that it truly can help people get their work done who are involved in software development? Martin, I know you have an opinion about this. I know Hope does too, I, but I'm going to go for it. <laughs> I mean, I think that was a safe assumption that both of us will have an opinion on, on this. Um, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely it is, you know, and uh, we, we were talking a little bit before the call in preparation for this, and I was, I, I was very happy he just clearly specified it was an internal developer portal he was asking the question about because we also talk about internal developer platforms and those two things over, could overlap. But you know those those IDPs and and the internal developer portal and the flow. I think it's a layer on top of you know what is already there or needs to be there to make that work. You know, I 
I think uh, it enables access to platforms that are built, enables access to tools, enables access to that, all that underlying stuff, you know, and the funny thing is, is that I, I think there is a tendency, you know, that IDPs, I'm going to put this into this developer portal in and it's going to make everything better instantly. And, and that is not the case. It's not, a, you know, there's, n we know there's no magic bullets for anything, right? All that, all it does is provide you a consistent way of accessing things, uh, you know, gives you visibility, maybe on your service catalog, utilization, access to documentation, APIs. It's a good single point to go to, but actually underneath that, you still need good CICD, you still need good platform management, you still need good security, you still need good, all of those things are what make successful rollouts of an IDP, you know, and interestingly, like, you know, it does take away some of the complexity, like some of the, some of the simplest uh, things I've seen in IDPs have been some of the most successful. So I've seen, for example, uh, they added the I want access to say GitHub Copilot on, you know, for my, uh, for my engineers, where do I go to get that? I go to the IDP <laughs> to get that, but it's a simple thing, right? And you know, whether they're using that in whatever IDP, uh, IDE that they use, right? Because, you know, engineers love their specifics, <laughs> but the enablement mm -hmm. of that and the integration of it was done through there, you know, whether that's provisioning up a, you know, a predefined, I want a service that deploys, here's my pipeline, everything that does the magic, right? To make that experience, that still relies on all the good stuff underneath, but it does provide good visibility, good, you know, good ways to access, but it's also probably a full-time job that somebody needs to keep on top of and because it never stands still. Don't build it and forget it. That's, that's where it's gonna, that's where it's gonna fail. You know, Hope, um, part of our research also, showed that 40 percent of the respondents said that they're already working on some form of a devops platform whatever you want to define yes. what that is starting to think this more holistically than about of a collection of tools that are you know have some integrations between them mm -hmm. it is um it is if if you think about it as um, one of the ways i've described it to someone it it's more than a toolkit. It's almost like this, this companion at work where if they are thinking, um, I need to accomplish a task in my job, they should be able to go to that platform and not only um, find tools, perhaps they can find uh, other information um, that, that will assist them. Um, so there could be dashboards there that provide insights right across the team across the enterprise that gives them information and context on their job and how maybe they are impacting other teams uh in their work um for me um they're also you know knowledge management can roll into mm -hmm. this platform so it's not just um i need to go shop for a new tool but also, what information is there um, that I can self-serve that will help me do my work? And maybe this information is um, collated from product documentation, but also some of this should be from peers within the organization so that they, they can stay current and up to date. You know, I, I wonder how do we, I saw an interesting thing on LinkedIn today. Mm -hmm. uh, someone was talking about measuring developer productivity and it was a little um, loop gif of somebody in a car with their camera, you know, like spying on yeah, developers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of like, we'll yeah. see if you're more productive. I, I think we're past the lines of code era. Maybe there's still Oh, I really hope so. That's terrible. Darth Vader's <laughs> out there measuring lines of code. Because I mean... Um, <laughs> it reminds me of when I was in school and, uh, you know, learning the C++ uh -huh. and I'm there and I'm looking at it and I went up to my instructor because everyone else, you know, the white and green bar paper, right? It's just Ooh. rolling there in the corner and I'm oh, looking yeah. at the problem and I go up to her and I say, um, if I can make this just as short as possible, you're fine as long as it works, right? And she said, yeah. 
I wrote it. One sheet. Gave it to her. She looked. She was like, great. Everyone else was like, how? And the problem with that is this. The lines of code problem, I could have I could have made that stretch out across. <laughs> hundreds. Hundreds. Right? Um, so, yeah. Lines of code, terrible for developer productivity. Well, you know, in the universe, for every a action, there's, there's an opposite equal reaction. So I think the reaction to C and C++ was Perl, which is oh I can gosh, do in yeah. one line what you can do in, you know, exactly. however many lines exactly. you go. Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, shrink, shrink it down. But, um, but one of the challenges, too, though, there are many organizations have no idea, none. They talk about developer productivity. They have a a vague idea of what they think it means and what they want. But then when it comes to measuring it, um, often they will push it toward, uh, you know, a scrum master, you know, what's velocity, what are the points, even though points are not the same across teams, right? right. Uh -huh. um, they will look at other measures that really aren't that meaningful and push out, in my opinion, push out, um, some of the good things that you get from teams, because if you push too much on efficiency, right, then, now you have a feature factory and uh, that has its own set of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, it, it, it's interesting. So let me throw this idea. Sometimes you're better off measuring the negative versus the positive. And there's times when you want to measure output and throughput and flow and all those kind of things. But what, I think one of the most important measures to think about is removing bottlenecks. How many, how many barriers, how many um, places where there are breakdowns have we been, have those things been repaired? And now those impediments, the impediments aren't stopping people from doing work or making them do Herculean efforts to get past that. That can be as effective, maybe more effective in really simplifying some of the complexity keeping flow glowing, you know, the output of it is a very positive thing where you're kind of removing that negative. Martin, your what are your thoughts on this? I I I I'm honestly glad that you kind of went there because that is, you know, quite often, uh, you know, those things are toiled the or the it's not even that, right? You know, actually they're saying, "Oh, it takes me a long time to get new features out." And they're saying, "Well, why?" And then when you look at it, it's not that the engineers are efficient it's actually because i know the tests take 12 hours to run and then if they fail they take 12 hours to run again right or it's just you know a manual step in the process or it's you know there's all sorts of things that ultimately become you know blockers for for that kind of efficiency and being able to spot those reduce those automate them make them smarter you know Whatever the solution is, quite often focusing on those is is what kind of enables that flow state <laughs> for the engineers that they they kind of feel like I'm building, it's being built, it's been deployed, it's been tested, it's been trusted, it's secure. I know it's ready to go. Somebody just needs to tick that box, right? And then I think even going beyond that, you know, things like um, quite often, and I, I see it as a maturity thing. I think we're seeing it more and more in that software delivery life cycle is people are going, yes, but like i want to be able to release things and you you know historically you've seen this thing if you can't deploy because i don't want to release the feature and i think more and more you know feature flags are becoming accepted or certainly desired i you know i think there's levels of uh, success of, in terms of implementation but it just makes that whole process even easier i you know it's deployed all the time it's deployed you know product manager you're in control of when you do your release management stuff right because you know the customers, but as an engineer, I know it's there, and I know if there's a problem, you can just turn it off. <laughs> it's, you know, and and so I think that whole flow piece becomes a uh, you know, let's pull out those negative pieces, let's make them easier, faster, smarter. Mm -hmm. Often, smarter is the is the best way to solve those, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, bring them back. And I'm I'm deliberately avoiding the the the, the word when I say smarter, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. I, I would like to also uh, offer a, a big contributor to teams 
being able to understand the bottlenecks and achieve the flow in very, very large organizations. There are organizations, 30,000, 40,000 uh, develop, developers, right, on teams. If you have a platform engineering team that builds the right hooks in across the organization so that you really actually have true value stream management and you can see it and you can repair it, now you have the intersection of the DevOps teams working with the platform engineering teams, perhaps the SREs as well, right? Because if they see uh, failures that are happening repeatedly, they can go back to the platform engineering team. Look, along this work stream, here's the part where we keep being called in. We don't want that. We created a fix. Can you make sure that it is uh, enabled across the enterprise? So for me, Platform engineering teams are not necessarily the ones um, impacted by these bottlenecks, but they can play a critical role in enabling the organization to be able to understand and have the right tooling and, and, and you know, again, hooks built in so that you have the visibility and get the right information at the right time. Let me, let me ask, um, We've kind of said this a little bit, maybe kind of talked around it. Should we re be rethinking DevOps and be thinking of it as a, as a platform approach? And there's good and bads to that too. There's the evil empire of, oh, it's just a way to make me more spend more more money with one vendor and also lock me in. That's the kind of, uh, I don't want to say that everybody's on that mission, but that's also the, uh, I just, if I'm going to do that, I want to do it in a way that I'm not like trapped um, and now beholden to you for the you know the rest of my development life, but there there is a, a good a good way of looking at platform for DevOps. How should we be thinking about that? Hope, hope, give us hope. <laughs> give it hope, hope. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it for me this this is somewhat situational. I can see different different perspectives for very small organizations versus very large organizations right but let's pretend we're in a very large organization because those are the, you know the sticky juicy uh meaty problems uh that we like to solve and like to look at um having a devops team on a platform absolutely but if the devops team is the platform team or I believe they share a lot of similarities. It's it's hard to divorce those um, from one another. I don't think they ever can be, again, hopefully the same thing. Because for me, years ago, DevOps teams, they were their own platform teams, right? That's why platform engineering uh, started to remove that work and, again, centralize it so that they won't they won't have uh, the overhead of figuring out what tools are we going to use. Let's test the tools. Let's make sure the tools are secure. Um, do the tools work with the other teams or are we here on an island uh, on our own? So for me, I, I, I don't see there, that there will ever be a time and, you know, technology always surprises us. Who saw AI coming in the way that it did? But let's say as of today, I don't see a time where a DevOps team and a platform team uh, would be overly conflated. Um, DevOps team need platform engineering teams and platform engineering teams have nothing to do <laughs> if uh, the DevOps teams uh, cease to exist. Interesting, okay. Martin, point, counterpoint, or are you agreeing with Hope? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think you can have platform engineering teams without having good DevOps and good DevOps teams, you know, whether they're separate or integrated, I think is debatable. And I think the size of the organization matters when you talk about that too. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I definitely don't think you can have one. And, and honestly, quite often building the platforms, especially if you're talking about building a developer platform rather than a just a C, CI, CD, you know, and tooling platform. I, you know, I think you need the DevOps practices all the way through that life cycle, right? You know, the 
the people who are building products using the platforms, using the tooling, you know, they need that. I, I also kind of have that view of, you know, do I think there should be a, you know, kind of following on a little bit from your question where you're saying, you know, do we think there should be a single, like a single tool that rules them all? <laughs> okay. Terrible thought of the range preference. I'm sorry. In, in a Sauron <laughs> kind of way. Okay, I see where yeah, you're going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, <laughs> it, that just is never going to be the case, right? But when you're when you're choosing your tooling and you're you're building out your platform for your organization, for you know, you want tools that actually are going to integrate with each other, right? And part of the job of the DevOps team and the platform team is to make sure that when they are making a selection of however many tools they decide to go with. I mean, you know, you, I believe the probably most organizations want some kind of consolidation. They want to deal with less partners, you know, and have some consistency. Absolutely making sure that they talk to each other well is going to be critical. And I think, you know, honestly, um, and I'm trying to be a little vendor agnostic when I say this, because I'm, what I really say is, you know, actually good vendors should make sure they interact with other tools, right? They, it, like if they're not doing that, how are they going to succeed? Right, you have to be able to integrate with other tools. There's just, you know, and actually the kind of burst of Gen AI and AI based stuff kind of shows that more than anything, right? Mm -hmm. You you need to be able to plug in new tools and new techniques and, you know, nothing stands still, right? What's good for your, I don't know, your feature flag tool today might not be good for your feature flag tool tomorrow. What's good for your infrastructure as code today might not be the way to do it tomorrow, right? And you need to be able to, have a set of tools that you can rely on to be able to adapt, right? And that you can swap some of them out, right? And bring something different in and still maintain the flow and the consistent experience for the, you know, for the people who are consuming it. So, you know, I think there's a lot to work with and those teams, I, you know, they're not, they're certainly not going away. They're certainly going to be busy. They've certainly got a lot to do. And especially if they're going for that, you know, uh, continual improvement, right? We mm -hmm. back to mm -hmm. core DevOps principles, you know, or the Kaizen principles, little small improvements all the time make everybody's life better. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, it, and, and what I'm thinking about is um, we haven't mentioned SRE directly, site reliability engineering too much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're often working on problems like, you know, what are the performance of our application under different mm -hmm. loads? Conditions. How do we make them more resilient as more as well as reliable, reliable and uh, kind of solving some of the uh, nitty gritty problems about helping improve our applications. But one of the challenges always is that feedback loop you were talking about, Martin, of how do you get those improvements back into the, the templates, the platform, the whatever it may be, the applications, the infrastructure, you know, all parts of it, it may touch. Um, it seems that, that we have the same thing when we go to a platform kind of approach where, you know, it, there's some things that's serving everyone, helping everyone, but there's also innovation improvements you want to make and how you're using that technology. It can't stand still or, or make you stand still. How do you build in those feedback loops so the people, whether it's DevOps teams or, or platform teams or engineer teams that are supporting some of that underlying environment. How do you build in that feedback and, and make it so that you can truly keep it evolving and keeping pace or helping you go where you need to go? Who wants to take that first? I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, it, it really is building, I'm a fan of systems, <laughs> but mm -hmm. number one, build an actual system, right? that takes it into account. Something that hopefully is, is somewhat foolproof, right? Whether you're using um, some aspects of PagerDuty, some aspects of, of Jira, whatever tooling you have, you are building some mechanism for visibility, some mechanism where if you have a certain tag or you've touched a certain system, um, other teams are informed and alerted. Uh, if it is simply that I am an SRE, I have done work. Now I need to set up a meeting and we know how much developers love meetings. I need to set up a meeting. I need to sit there. I need to go through documentation. I, it, all of that, uh, it, it doesn't work well, but um, basics of DevOps, automating. Find a way to automate 
the, the feedback, a way to automate the insights, um, a way to uh, publish the information. Ideally, then the platform engineering team picks it up and they integrate whatever learnings or changes uh, need to be made. I, I agree with pretty much all of that, yeah. You do need those. I, as you started that 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 whole uh, discussion about you know believing in the systems, I I have a colleague and uh, I could just uh, see it, like him sitting on a call opposite me and right behind him, like made out of metal, he has a trust the process uh, <laughs> thing Ooh, behind him. And as you say, you know, I believe in systems. <laughs> I I I I was thinking of the trust the process thing behind him as you're doing that, but it, it is true, right? You 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 do need to have a process, a system in place that allows those feedback loops to happen. And um, I had a previous CEO at a previous company, and uh, he got up at one of our company kickoffs one year, and he said, you know, we we have a culture problem in our organization. He said, you know, and culture eats everything else for breakfast because if we don't fix the culture, we can't fix all those things. I think you know it goes back to those core DevOps principles of having a culture of feedback, a culture of getting that back in the loop, actually dealing with that. And I I totally agree that the ability these days, especially now, to kind of automate some of those feedback cycles, you know, get them in there automatically, get them visible automatically, get them summarized in a nice way, right? Take advantage of of AI and you know generative AI to create really nice summaries from the data that our own systems are generating because one thing almost all DevOps and platform engineering teams are really good at is having a lot of data that they're not quite sure what to do with well you know let's let's use the tools at our disposal to to really drive out those, that data value and drive drive that back into the systems you know there's um the, the trust in the in putting it in metal on your wall is definitely a commitment. Um, but, you know, trusting in the process, you can also, also take that too far. You know, I would add, but don't dogmatically trust in the process. And by that, I mean, Agreed. one of the things that we need to build in is we're better off if we're building, we build in the ability to have variance in the process. And here's why I say that is you want to build in the, the capability of experimenting, right? Because you may run into ideas or have changes or things you want to try, just like we want to try products and software in production to try different features or uh, ideas in market. Um, but you don't have to change the whole system to try an idea, right? Let's have a path where we can do this variation and see what the results are and see if that's something we want to standardize on more broadly, right? So think about variation as a positive for to, get, to help you innovate and try new ideas, try a different tool for that part, whatever it might be. So integrate something else, whatever it might be. So I, I would add that on. Um, I want to take, take your Gen AI comment. <laughs> uh, Jess Lee, I think, is, is the person's name. I have to read this question. Long ago, far away in a distant galaxy, you slapped some JCL <laughs> on a card deck, you pushed it through the window, and you waited for the reams of paper, the green reams, green and white reams, a paper announcing yeah. success or failure. Platform engineering replaces that JCL. It requires specialized knowledge to write complex JCL. Why can't we push that knowledge into a Gen AI and allow the programmer to just write code again? Boy, there's that that's spanning a long time period. I don't know forwards or backwards, but I think all at the same I, time. <laughs> so Jesse. I'm thanks. old enough to remember the green and white paper. So you know, oh. let's just not <laughs> I can't my I can't very first job. disclose whether I wrote any punch <laughs> card, but that's a different topic. But <laughs> so let's talk about that of of how can we use to me, in, in one way, Gen AI is a form of automation, right? How can we have other things perform tasks for us? And I think that's kind of where Jess Lee's going with this idea of let's take the things that are maybe they're also repetitive, but they also require specialized knowledge about how to do some things. Maybe everybody doesn't have to be a whatever expert on how to, you know, Terraform. You don't have to, and everybody yeah. needs to know Terraform, right? Maybe that's the new JCL just to pick something. How do we how do we think about Gen AI both in the tools that we use, but also uh, in the platforms and improving our processes? Or if you're from Canada, processes. Yeah, <laughs> I I love that actually. I mean, I I I would say it's I'm a strong believer that you know I want 
I want Gen AI to take away difficult things, like things that things that just cause me a problem that like make my life easier. And I want that in the tools that I use. Um, I'm going to use our own a couple of our own examples here, but they're very generic. <laughs> so, but like you know, things like generating a dashboard. I don't. I don't want. I personally don't want to be an expert in writing. You know, looker queries to generate a really good dashboard. What I really want to do is say, hey, for all the products in uh, our product set, please tell me the frequency of deployment and success rate over the last three months, group by month. That's what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to ask that question and I want that day. I want it to know what data to go and get. I want it to work out what the query is. I want it to group it beautifully on the page and present it to me and say, here's the dashboard you asked for. Right. And I didn't have to learn any of the complex stuff under the covers to do that. Right. And, you know, putting that into context of some other stuff, you know, uh, I, and I can kind of ignore the code generation piece a little bit, but like maybe the, I've just done some security scan and it's telling me that I've introduced some horrible SQL injection or whatever it is, right? Uh, and Gen AI is really good at saying, hey, this is how you should solve this. Like, you know, here's the, here's the code you can solve this. In fact, if you click this button, I can make this into a PR against your code base to solve that problem for you, right? Like making those things easier so that the you know, kind of, you know, whether that's the engineer, whether that's me, because some of those are personal to me, like making that easier and fitting it into the process where we're using it trained on the model to whether that's, you know, the database query lookup, to solving a security problem, understanding your code base, maybe creating a summary from all the commits for your PR, right? Mm. Hey, there's 25 commits I've done. And do you know what? I'm going to summarize that into a nice summary that you can just read. <laughs> <laughs> and then you tweak a little bit and go, hey, here's my PR. And look, it's well written. And I, it's me a minute instead of 25 minutes, right? Make sure all I see things. it when it goes above or below this threshold, right? Help yeah. me out. Yeah. Yeah. But they're all little things, but all those little things, like, you know, five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 20 minutes there. Suddenly you've got like an hour or an hour or two of your day back, maybe 10 hours a week back. And suddenly, you know, those little things that Gen AI can do makes it super helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's before you get to the big stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I think one of one of the challenges right now, though, is um, for some developers, those AI tools are <laughs> still separated um, and and individualized. Right? If they want to do one thing, they go to one tool. They go to another. They go to another. But one concept that recently has started to gain steam, another I for a DP is the intelligent developer platform, right? So if you, uh, Jesley, I'm not sure where you work, but if you go to your organization and say, hey, we need an intelligent developer platform so that we can get intelligent assistance, uh, maybe an intelligent automation, intelligent insights across the SDLC. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because now you can get help with uh, maybe workflow automation insights, um, as Martin was highlighting, resource management, even maybe security and compliance recommendations. So um, I have yet to lay my hands on an intelligent developer platform, but, but I hope to very soon. Sort of the search for intel search for intelligent life, the SETI of intelligent platforms. Yes. Developer platform. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I I would say there's uh, there's there's intelligence growing in the platforms. I wouldn't is. necessarily say they're intelligent yet, right? That is <laughs> yeah, right. And and they are on the way. They really are on the way. But yeah. when we get to the point where you know it passes. Uh, what we would typically call a hype cycle and, and more people mm -hmm. start to adopt it. Uh, it's going to be revolutionary. I think for a lot of people who've been doing this work. Well, Paul P loves your advice, by the way. So um, I, I'll hope. So let's talk about security. We could do a whole, and we will do a whole session on talking about DevSecOps and talking about security. One of the things that I'm evangelizing is We've, we've been kind of making the same mistake the security folks made for years, which is thinking of security as 
here's security there for code scanning, here's security there for secrets management, here's security there for this, and then it's for that. When in, in, and then we start running into supply chain as an issue. Whoops, guess, guess that's a little more systemic than one little thing. So thinking about DevSecOps this way of, it's how I create secure software all the way through the SDLC from concept through uh, delivery and operations. But it's also the underlying platform that we're using to create that and the inputs to that, whether it's external code and repositories, our own code um, and secure, you applying security principles of those, the steps, if you will, that flow in that process and thinking about that. And it seems like taking a platform approach from a DevOps perspective is much more supportive of that kind of a strategy. It also, one of the outputs of security is compliance, governance, you know, helping us apply security policies and know that we're doing that thing, those things and being able to, to demonstrate that or have the artifacts to say, here's, yeah, we say we do this and we do it because we've got the data to back it up. And here's whether it's improving security or not. I'd love to get your perspective on how does security fit into this DevOps platform SRE collaboration flow and in in less than 10 minutes because that's all we've got <laughs> maybe, maybe okay. you can dive into this a little bit at least into one one end of the pool for a little while martin uh, might you take first crack at it sure i mean i I'm, my view is it should be it should be all the way through it like it should be woven through security isn't something you add on afterwards it's something you do from the get-go you know i <clears throat> I know uh, Nick was originally meant to be here instead of me, uh, my colleague, uh, and one of his favorite phrases is that we like to, you know, shift information left, <laughs> shift the information left, not necessarily the work, right? Mm, Actually okay. letting know, um, you know, let an engineer know before he even pushes his code up to the code repository that he's introducing a vulnerability is the most in context place he can get that information. I've just written the code, I'm trying to push it. I can't push it, it's got a security vulnerability. And ideally, here's what you need to do to fix it, right? But all the way through the process, that should be there. And then in terms of governance and you know, making sure that we know, you know, you wanna know that, hey, this was you know, committed by X, it was reviewed by Y. These were the security tests that were run. At what point? This is when the artifact was created and, and it's signed, right? And here's all the places it's been deployed and here's all the tests that have been run on it. And, you know, here's where it's now deployed in production. And so, you know, when another zero day vulnerability comes along and we know they're going to happen, we, we hope that they're not, but we know that they are, <laughs> that you can actually go to that system, uh, you know, and you've got all that audit trail of everywhere it is and say, OK, I know I have this library in these places and I can fix it. And you know what? I know which pipelines I need to run to get it deployed and to which environments. Let's go do that, right? And making that just core and part and parcel with the information to the right people at the right time is how you do that successfully. But it is never an afterthought. It has to be right in there. Excellent. Before you before you jump in, um, Hope, I also want to point folks to the handout section. Got some great documents, some really good data on platform engineering, its adoption, um, kind of its role in implementation of the organization. One one of the people asked about kind of roles of responsibilities of the different roles of DevOps, platform engineering, et cetera. Point you to that as well. Some great uh, webinars coming up, and I pinned the survey to the top of the chat. So please. Uh, participate in that. We'd love your feedback. Okay. Big wind up. Give you a little bit of pause there. Hope to get ready. I knew you were ready. You were ready to jump in. You don't need the wind up. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so total agreement with Martin and the the phrase, even it, it would seem uh, unbelievable, but sometimes when you say shift left, uh, some people, hmm, tell me more. What exactly does that mean? So the phrase that I have used successfully is secure by design, right? No matter where you are in the SDLC, no matter what you are touching, secure by design. So think about it in, in every part of how you do your work. And one of the other big parts though is, um, we think about the testing and security, but there has to be some connection to larger security organization uh, in the company. 
um, not going to name names, but at uh, uh, some companies I have worked at in the past, they would develop software and never talk to the security team. And then it's on the verge of go live. And the security team says, hey, wait a moment. Can, can do you mind if we take a look at that? And now the project is, is completely off track, right? Mm -hmm. So not only secure in um, what you have your actual hands-on building, but making sure that also across the organization, you're, you're talking to your security team because they are not just there to make sure your email and your VPN and everything else uh, is working well, but they're also interested in how the software is developed. I want to point folks to um, a few things that are coming up too. We're uh, in, in uh, CloudBees as a sponsor. I can't remember if Harness is or not, but Platform Con is coming up, I think, on June 4th. And we have a special session that we're doing on sort of as platform engineering, the new DevOps, a lot of what we've been talking about, we'll get some other perspectives on this. So I pasted the, the link in, you know, of, of that into the chat. So be sure and uh, participate or join that. And there'll be some other great conversation on this. Um, Martin, any, any kind of wrap up thoughts as we uh, conclude today's session? Uh, you know what? I was unprepared for that last question, but uh, as in <laughs> any wrap up thoughts, that. <laughs> I mean that that's okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, I I think there's some there is a bunch of great resources out there. It's been a really lovely discussion, honestly. I've totally enjoyed it. I've had a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I'm happy to connect and talk with anybody post this uh, discussion uh, more about that. Uh, you know, and and what I think the platform is and, you know, I'm happy to be told differently. So I <laughs> love to talk about that. <laughs> I love all the different points of view. So, you know, please absolutely get in touch. Okay. Wonderful. I'm also going to uh, paste in a link to a great webinar that's coming up on the 19th of June. I'm choosing the right DevOps tool chain, something customizable or all, all, all in one okay. tied directly to a lot of what we're talking about today. So, check out that um, webinar as well. Hope, oh, parting parting gifts, parting thoughts? Uh, parting thoughts. Um, same as Martin, reach out, questions, comments, controversy. I love a little controversy. Um, but one of the things, you know, don't just look inward uh, when you're thinking about these problems and these challenges that, that you come across. You may have a team, you may have an apart, a department but there are other people in your organization who are probably uh, feeling the same pain. So if you don't currently have a platform engineering team, but want one, uh, there, is, there is strength in numbers, right? Strength in numbers. Uh, make your voice heard somehow. Totally agree. Okay. Very good. Um, I'm also going to put another link in here. We have an upcoming session um, on June 6th, DevSecOps, a refreshing look at software and supply chain security. Um, CloudBees, Harness, JFrog are also sponsors of that conversation. So if um, this is a, obviously it's a hot area because there's a lot of conversation and discussion going about how do we solve some of these problems more holistically in a way that um, not only kind of creates the desired standardization and, or governance, but also does it in a way that uh, people will adopt and make it part of our, not only our tool chain, but our culture and how we work together. So there's some extremely good, good uh, pieces that are happening together. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, Jared just pasted the same link in that I did. Thanks, Jared, buddy. Appreciate that. Hey, I want to shout out to um, Heidi and to Cody and to Jared for helping us put today's program together. I want to shout out to CloudBees and Harness for being sponsors of our conversation and being great partners in our um, De uh, Got DevOps series and some of the research that's happening at TechStrong Research. Especially I want to thank everybody for being with us today. You know, we've spent almost one minute away from spending an hour together. The fact that you would spend an hour with us your time is extremely valuable. And the fact that you would spend that with us, um, it's a great privilege and we're, we're honored that you would do that. So I hope you'll join us for any a number of upcoming conversations on this because I think every one of them helps advance the ball down the field. 
So thank you. Please fill out that that survey. Hope, love you. Martin, love you. Thank you much. It's great to have you have you both here and look forward to our next conversation. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. you know, be safe out there <laughs> and have fun doing DevOps platform engineering and SRE. We'll talk to you soon.